Hi, welcome to Off Script. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we're taking a look at F9, The Fast Saga, the ninth film, the Fast and Furious franchise. Andy and I went and watched it, and we're going to tell you whether or not it's worth your time. We also took a look at Luca on Disney+, Plus, the new uh, Pixar film that's making some waves. We're excited to talk about that, tell you what we think. We got three hot new trailers for new stuff that's coming out that dropped this week that we're going to talk about between our reviews. And before we get to all of it, we need to talk about the news. Unfortunately, not a lot of news this week, but the big story, really the, the one big thing we're all talking about, is the box office. Uh, Fast 9 yeah, made $70 million this weekend. And I, I would have put it on screen for those of you watching at home on Facebook, but I already left it on from when we were doing pre-production from the show. So there it is. Fast 9 <laughs> killing it at the box office. Andy, who, who could have seen this coming? I mean, we knew it was going to make... Big money. It's not a surprise, even in the pandemic, that it's kind of leading the charge. It did make less than the kind of uh, the last opening, uh, Fate of the Furious, uh, but it did make more than Hobbs and Shaw uh, opening weekend. So it is still very strong. And again, their theaters are only at about eighty percent open. We're still not back to where to where we were. Um, but it's big numbers, and no one's surprised that this franchise has been a staple of the box office for twenty years now. Yeah, uh, they did themselves some favors, right? One, they waited, right? They waited through the pandemic. They waited for a good time to launch. They waited for a summer window, which is exactly when a Fast, Fear, Fast and Furious movie should be coming out. And they made it theaters only, right? There's no there's no streaming services where you're going to come go see Fast and Furious. You got to go to the theater. It's the only way. So it makes it easy to track these numbers and see that they're killing it, right? Right. It, you're exactly right. They, um, again, they held on. They, they, Elected. I mean, right when the pandemic began, they said we're going to wait a year. They're, you know, they didn't try to push to later in the summer or the fall or the, or whatever. They just waited a whole year, and it was it was definitely the right uh, move for them. And it's also they're enjoying a box office that has opened up a lot more than in the last couple of months. You know, we've seen the success of, of King Kong or Kong versus Godzilla, Godzilla versus Kong, um, and uh, a Quiet Place too. So there's the the box office kind of got warmed up with with some of these a little bit smaller films that still did really well and then just led the way for uh, Fast 9. Additionally, uh, Fast 9 is not just available in digital cinemas. It's also available in IMAX. They got those premium formats, right? So you could pay a little bit extra and they can make a little bit more money. Or, in the unique case of Andy, you can go see it in D-Box which That's I didn't know right. anything about and I'm excited to talk about uh, whenever we get to the, I guess, the proper review. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's one thing to help premium formats, uh, IMAX, um, like I said, these these fancy D box seats, and it, every little bit bit helps. Um, and it's also it's already done great money overseas. It's at over four hundred million, so it's probably going to be a, another billion dollar uh, property. Um, we have the July Fourth weekend coming up. There's no, it, it has no competition yet. The Forever Purge is the new <laughs> big release. Um, so it has no competition going into a big holiday weekend. Uh, it's going to make us a ton. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if it makes even more money this following weekend. Yeah. And uh, two weeks from now is when Black Widow comes out, which will presumably knock it off of the top spot. But we'll have to wait and see. Of course, we'll be covering it on the show. So if you want to hear our Black Widow review in a couple of weeks, subscribe to the show. Just, just scroll down, hit that button right now while you're listening. Easy. And then you subscribe and you got it. Uh, but what's, I guess, not really surprising about F9's success here in the States is how important it was to just kind of wait for the right time, right? Which leads to our other story. Uh, Patience was a virtue for studios that held on to their films. Paramount, Universal with A Quiet Place 2, uh, or sorry, Paramount with A Quiet Place 2, Universal with F9. Both are finding a lot of success right now um, because people are just more comfortable going back to the movies. Hollywood Reporter is saying that like 78% of theater goers are saying they're totally fine with going back. Like, well, I think, I think, I think we're turning a corner here, Andy, a very slow, very slow, long corner. Yeah. Just personally, I've seen the theaters be more full and I, I usually go at the cheap times like uh, matinees or first, first day showings. Um, and the theaters are slowly filling up and, and people are definitely getting out. And, and again, holding the hot properties was really the move. Although um, IMAX or um, HBO Warner Brothers with their decision to go hybrid hasn't been a complete loss because King Kong has made over four hundred million dollars, and it was released in both. For, you could see you watch it at home, so you know that's that's a strong argument that the hybrid release does not hurt the box office numbers. Yeah, 
I mean, that definitely doesn't 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 hurt anything. Um, I don't really have any hot takes on this. I'm going to be honest. I feel like it 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 kind of you know it is what it says on the tin. People people are ready to go back. Well, that and also, I mean, some people did did think you know that the pandemic was going to be the death, the literal death of cinema. Like we were going to see theaters close. People weren't going to go back to the theaters. Everything was going to be streaming, and we saw that didn't happen because uh, there's still there's hot properties that you did that need to be seen on the big screen that are better. Uh, on there and we we've acknowledged kind of the emergence of this like new category of like well i could watch it at at the theater but now i'm gonna watch it at home because i can and you know it what it's made is that if i go to the theater it's got to be really good like hollywood has to try even harder because there's a lot of things that come out they're like no i would just watch i'd rather just watch that at home yeah and um yeah i don't i don't know if that's a bad thing I, i was a little excited at least i think towards the middle of the pandemic by the idea of like the mid budget film making a return to cinemas, right? Like movie theaters, not having mo- the studios, not having to make these like giant blockbuster productions in order to get people in seats. I, I-, I like this idea of like, Hey man, maybe, maybe theaters will close and we'll, we'll get a kind of a return to like the smaller art house cinema nationally. Like maybe that'd be a good thing that help us grow as a culture. I was wrong. People <laughs> want explosions <laughs> and they want CGI. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, we're just, we're just going to wind the clock back and just keep doing what we're doing even more so. And that's okay. Uh, there's a ton of cool stuff coming out this summer. Disney's got Jungle Cruise coming out. Warner Brothers has Suicide Squad. Marvel's got Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. The Eternals. Top Gun Maverick is coming out later in the winter. And Spider-Man and The Matrix. Like, it's a good year to be at the movies for sure. Um, I guess I'm excited to say people are back. Yeah. And I'm, I also am selfishly bummed that I have to share a theater with other <laughs> smelly patrons chewing their popcorn uh-huh. and doing their thing yeah well and it's gonna be interesting with this again this hbo deal where they're doing hybrid releases that made total sense at the beginning of the year with the pandemic still kind of in in full force um but now we're as we're emerging out of it it's kind of um well do we really need that hybrid release but they've you know allegedly committed to the entire year of hybrid hybrid releases um hbo max that is uh, so we'll see, because I mean, things like the mate, the fourth Matrix movie are supposed to be in a hybrid release. Yeah, and we're assuming they likely will not do that after this year. It may just be a one and done. But we'll have to wait and see. Who knows? I think I think Warner's is, Warner Brothers has been having a lot of success with it on their platform. It's Either definitely way, an, an option that we didn't have before. It's true, and I don't mind that option. I've taken advantage of that option an awful lot. Uh, had I had the means, I might have even watched Fast Night at home. Of course, I couldn't. Had to go to the theater and see it. But like we said, there's multiple ways to see it at the theater, which is why I want to ask Andy how his experience was watching it in a D box cinema. For people who aren't in the state or have never been to Cinemark where D box is, what what is it, Andy? Give us like the explain like I'm five. So it's a little bit like a, a ride. You buy. A premium you pay a premium to sit in these d-box seats and at my theater they are red they're these bright red seats um but they they rumble so they sh- they shake like you know rumble controller would on a video game console and then they also tilt and move so it's a little bit like a, a you know pilot's chair or like a like a disney ride would be the, so the the seat itself actually t- tilts like forward and backward left to right um and rumbles a uh, wall this is going on and um i never had to bought one of these seats because before because uh they were they're pretty expensive and i just never saw really saw the point but it was actually a lot of fun especially something for it like f9 when there's lots of driving and shooting like basically the, the chair is just going wild the entire time because of all the the crashes and the driving and the, the you know the shootouts and and whatnot so if you're gonna do it it definitely needs to be for like a big action movie I always saw this them advertising this whole D-Box thing, but I think at some point I signed up for like a lamer version of it. There there was a movie I went and saw at some point that I'm like 90% sure was in this like D-Box function, but it was not like the seat didn't move. It was like, I don't know if it was like back when they were just figuring it out or it was just louder speakers. And I don't know what the deal was, but there was no like movement or shaking. So if you're going to pay a premium, I can appreciate this a little bit more like an amusement park ride. Was it distracting from the film? That's what I want to know. Um, it was maybe a little, so you can, <laughs> it was a little bit, so you can uh, turn up and down. Like they have uh, like a thing you can turn up the intensity or turn down the intensity a little bit like a volume knob. And I definitely had mine all the way up. And there were a couple of mines where, times where i was like this might be a little much i might need to turn this down and i didn't of course um but it's it it does have like four settings of intensity that you can 
set your seat to. Um, I was going to make a joke about how like an amusement park, on, a, on, a, on a roller coaster amusement park ride, they have a sign like you have to be this tall to ride the D box. Right. Which is silly. But I'm curious, did they have any like weight restrictions? I mean, they got to Like, surely there's got to be people out there I mean, that they do I not recommend. They didn't have more. any. Yeah, they didn't have any listed anywhere I saw. I'm sure there is. That somewhere. works. And this is a, this is a Cinemark location, right? That's who does it. I don't, yeah. I don't know if AMC has anything quite like that. Uh, that 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 yeah, kind of gimmick approach. But all right, good to know. D box, not the worst. With that, I mean, Andy, please take it away. You're gonna be you're gonna be hitting fast nine for us. Uh, don't let me stop, y'all. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> okay. F nine, the fast saga. So we are back for the ninth installment of the Fast and Furious franchise there's a lot of f's in there um where we see the return of dominic toretto and family and family. <laughs> every, every everyone back for uh, the international spy game. again somehow this turned from street racing into international espionage spy film spy action films i'm not not sure how that happened anyways uh the beginning, beginning of our story the the uh crew is summoned by an sos from Mr. Nobody, who's kind of the handler from some of the previous films. Uh, the crew is called out to um, help, you know, stop terrorists from getting hold of this technology that will essentially end the world if they get their hands on it. It's a very much kind of a Mission Impossible uh, kind of plot setup. We find ourselves in different locations, Mexico, London, Edinburgh, Tokyo, all over the world. We're globetrotting. Um, and we, I don't. It's we don't really want to get into the plot too much more than that. And then we have our tons of car chases and action scenes. And among this, we discover that there is a rogue agent played by John Cena, who is uh, revealed in the trailer to be Dominic Toretto's brother, younger brother uh, named Jacob Toretto. And we get some backstory. We get some flashback scenes into kind of their origin story, the things with their father, things that are actually mentioned in the first two films, which I'd completely forgotten, um, but is actually, you get to see some of this on, on screen in flashbacks amongst all of the carnage and car chases and car explosions and all that. So if you've seen any of the, the movies, we're back to form, lots of action, lots of quips, lots of jokes, um, this heavy, heavy, serious emphasis on family bonds, um, and a whole lot of fun. And it's really long at two hours and 25 minutes. So Zach, what'd you think? So I'm a little out of sorts with the Fast and Furious films. I've seen like maybe three or four of them before now. So jumping into the ninth film in the franchise means I'm a little, a bit of a fish out of water. Um, Fast 9 does not make a whole lot of attempts to remedy this for new viewers. They kind of just assume you're caught up. The movie does not slow down to tell you, hey, here's what you need to know. Here's these characters they are important. Kind of just drops you right in and takes off from there. And at two and a half hours, that's quite the endeavor for somebody who hasn't been sitting in the theater for a while. I was not as charmed with this movie as I wanted to be. Mainly because it's not made for me. It just isn't. And I figured it totally would be, right? Like the other films were. Or the, the past ones I'd seen earlier in the franchise. But Fast and Furious has become a, a much more of a family-friendly box office staple than like a action franchise aimed at 20 to 40 year old males um this does not have the same vibe i thought it was going to have and i was a little sore on it but maybe it's worth another rewatch i'm not a big fan of the franchise i think there's some things it does well uh let's jump on into it andy where's the best place to start well i wanted to mention that i, I actually saw this twice over the weekend because i saw it with twice a, in two days yeah with a couple of, of different people or i went by myself the first time and then i saw it with a friend uh the next day uh, I saw it in IMAX the first time, which um, came with the preview for Jurassic Park Dominion, Jurassic World Dominion, which is the third in installment in that series. Uh, that was super lame. Uh, that, like half the preview was just like in prehistoric times. So it was a bunch of CGI dinosaurs. No one cares. And then the second half was the uh, dinosaurs kind of in modern times trampling through a drive through cinema um no oh, yeah. story no plot no kind of no characters that, yeah, yeah I, I i did see it as well it looked like something they, they put together in cgi and then went out and like shot on the back lot real fast like nothing nothing fancy in this in this thing really really lame yeah i uh usually when they do these these previews you get kind of the opening scene like uh i remember seeing the opening scene to tenet 
you know, the uh, opera siege, you get to see the first eight minutes of that. Or like a uh, famous one is the, the Dark Knight preview that where you saw the bank robbery opening. Um, this is usually the kind of preview you get in, in these IMAX things. And this was just, I mean, it was lame. It was super lame. And I was upset that I had paid for it to see it in, in IMAX. Yeah. And, and one more note on it before we get too far away from, cause I, I, like I said, I saw it too. Um, it opens before fast nines. It, it opens like after, after the cinema like credits roll, like AMC pops up, like, welcome back to the theaters or cinema has a thing. Then you start in the, on the Jurassic dominion world dominion trailer and then you get the logo credits and like studio credits for fast nine so for like the audience in my theater that that like didn't see it coming they weren't like pleased that they wasted like eight minutes watching stupid dinosaur cgi that was unexplained before their fast and furious yeah movie. like they just want to get to the goods and i can't blame them so misstep in my opinion but anyway onto the I, th fun. I thought that too that that they should have had like a title card or something yeah that weird. just so weird, weird audiences choice. who know if, if you aren't savvy like us and, and know that you, that uh, there was a preview was, of that movie was coming hmm. um yeah so that the, there's things that fast nine does right um it, again it, it's kind of like like marvel if you've only seen a handful of the marvel film then you try to jump in at the end you're gonna be completely lost um, and that's how I felt about this. Uh, there's a, a ton of references and story plot points to people and events in the past, which I have no idea what's going on. Um, there's a ton of cameos in this. And I, I, a lot of times I didn't know when something was a cameo and then when someone, something was a, actually a setup for something new. Um, this is going to be a small spoiler. Uh, there's a, a cameo by Cardi B. Um, where she shows up with some SWAT people and she's got like her crew. And I thought she had been in, I was like, oh, she must've been in one of the other films and she's popping up. And uh, the friend that I saw that saw this with that knows the series better, like, no, she's never been in them, but maybe they're setting something up for the future. Cause she references like the Dominican Republic or something where they were in the series. So, but like, I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah, like like I said earlier, Fast Nine um, makes no effort to handhold with you at all. They assume you either know what's happening or you're just like, you, you I don't know, you, you're not going to care. And and that's kind of where I ended up. Like at some point, I just stopped caring about who was coming on screen and who wasn't because I just didn't know. I was like, I don't I don't know who a third of these characters are. You know, I know some of them, but a lot of them. No familiarity. When Andy told me, yeah, Cardi B's character isn't hasn't actually been in a Fast and Furious film before now, is like could have fooled me. I had no clue. I re I really didn't know. And it, it the, like the lack of handholding is almost stark. Like it really is. It's it's a deliberate decision, and um, I think it's to you know keep keep, keep fans of it tight tight in and keep them plugged in. And hey, we're we're catering this experience to you. That's the message Paramount is giving people. This is. Yeah. For you, these are movies for you, the fans, and we're not trying to appeal to some big wide audience, even though that's exactly who's going to see these movies. It's basically serialized film. Serialized, it's, it's turning into TV. It's right. TV. You're, you're popping in. You're, if you yeah, haven't seen the, the first five seasons, you're going to be lost in season six. You know. Right. You're, you're popping in on the ninth episode of a sitcom, and you're expecting them to tell you what's happening. And it's like, they don't do that. Like you, you, We expect that you've seen everything up till now. So... Really interesting choice. Uh, I, I I know these movies are aimed at kind of wider audiences. I figured it would kind of hold my hand a little bit, but no, they really don't do that. Um, but obviously, people aren't turning up for the characters, right? They're there for the cars, and they're there for the action, and for yeah, blowing stuff up. Exactly. You're there for the sweet action. You're there for this, the cool-looking cars, doing impossible things, the impossible stunts, stunts that, like, things that are possible for cars, for people, stunts that would get people killed. Uh, one of the things that, that makes me laugh is that Vin Diesel always just has a T-shirt on, like, no matter how dangerous the the situation is. So, like, you know, there's, like, gunfire, and you got guys in, like, bulletproof vests and tactical gear, and he's just got, like, you know... Uggs and uh, Uggs in a t-shirt is <laughs> going in, into battle. Right. Diesel Diesel's wardrobe in this film consists of one of two outfits. He's like Homer Simpson in the morning when he opens up his closet. <laughs> and it's all the same outfit. It's either tan carpenter boots, jeans, and a, and a very clean white tee, right? Like just off the line white tee. Or it's carpenter boots, jeans, very clean tank top, just off the line like white tank top. It's going to be one or the other every scene. Always solid colors. I think in one flashback scene, he's got like a slight pattern on a gray tank, but otherwise solid colors, 
Same colors ever ever seen. He's not uh, allowed to wear stripes. Vin Diesel, everybody. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 as boring and as bland as his performance. Um as far as the action goes, because because I want to I want to save kind of performances for for a minute. Um, the action's solid, like uh, you know it's it's two and a half hours, uh, which means there's a lot of time when you're not in cool action set pieces, but lots of movement in the camera, lots of quick editing. Uh, Justin Lin returns to direct this feature. Uh, he directed Fast and Furious three through six, so that's Tokyo Drift through. Was it called Fast Six? I'm not even sure. I don't I don't, so four of them for now. And then he did this one, Fast Nine. He's also doing uh, 10 Part One and Part Two, which are the supposedly the last two in the franchises. franchise coming next. Uh, so he'll be in it for a minute. But uh, he's got some experience with the franchise and he, he brings it. He's got a lot of color, a lot of motion. I mean, you can see just looking at the movie poster. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things happening in this film, but you know car chases are car chases i guess uh fast and furious has, has evolved into this like spy game kind of thing where none of the actual players in the film have to answer to any masters they don't actually have like a spy headquarters they go to they hang out in like a sewer that they joke looks like <laughs> it fell out of a ninja turtles movie um and they have like seemingly unlimited money and resources to accomplish whatever these kind of inane tasks that they have are and in this movie yeah they're 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 kind of catching up with this uh, unknown Toretto brother, John Cena playing, playing Vin Diesel's brother. And uh, they've got to figure out what his thing is and stop him from blowing up the world or something, you know, steal, steal the hard drive to keep the satellite from nuking yeah, yeah, whatever from orbit. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's a little paint by numbers. I yeah. It's, so. it's, it's a plot device. Um, yes. Yeah. Which reminds me, I definitely wanted to talk about uh, performances. Um, we got a really big cast here. A lot of which were in, you know, the original films, uh, like obviously <laughs> Vin Diesel, um, Michelle Rodriguez, and uh, Jordana Brewster. I don't know which film she's been in and has. It. I don't think she's been in a lot of the recent ones. Uh, but she shows up in this. Can all of a sudden is, is like a ninja martial artist uh, <laughs> yeah. herself. Uh, we, we have um, Tyrese Gibson and of course Ludacris back as Roman and, and Tej. Uh, they're a lot of fun. There are a lot of, um, they, you know, they have a lot of jokes, a lot of quips, a lot of arguing, uh, a lot of fun stuff. We Zach and I were discussing that uh, Vin Diesel is, is easily the worst actor in this bunch, and like easily handily, he, like he's like the you know one of the main characters, if not the main character, but he's so easily replaceable. There's <laughs> yes, and literally everybody in the poster is staged around Vin Diesel. He is like the lead, and he is easily the worst. Well, he has like, less Quentin. lines. Qu yes. Yeah, like what is one, one Vin Diesel quote? Other than Family. living, other than living yeah. his life uh, one quarter mile at a time. The movies. Um, <laughs> he's terrible. He's terrible in this movie. I, I don't know if he's been terrible in all of them. Like, I know there was a time he wasn't too bad. But, like, I, I, I told Andy, I'm reminded of, like, what's the, be what's the best analogy I'll run with? Pier Pierce Brosnan in Mamma Mia, I think, is the, is the better one. Um, Pierce Brosnan was in Mamma Mia one, right? The ABBA movie where like they sing and they dance Meryl Streep's in it. It's, it's a musical and Pierce Brosnan's in it and Pierce Brosnan cannot sing. He cannot carry a tune. He's terrible. And in the first Mamma Mia, they had him sing. He's one of the leads. He's going to sing and he's awful. And all his numbers were bad. So in the second one, he came back and they were like, Hey, we're going to have you in some singing numbers again, but you're only featured in like one for like two verses. And then otherwise you're completely in the background. You never really singing, but you're in the movie. Like you're, you're still there, but like you're terrible. So we're not going to like give you a lot to work with. That's exactly what happens to Vin Diesel in this movie. Like all of his lines are lame and he mumbles almost all of them and he's bloated and he's got that dad gut and like you can barely see his muscles like <laughs> they don't even show that much anymore and he's got this spray tan and it's awful it's awful it's like watching a train wreck on screen like i couldn't look away and, and like in that way it definitely attracts attention but like everybody is better everybody is better than him Ludacris is better and Ludacris is a terrible actor <laughs> like he's he's awful and he's better than him and like i feel bad i feel bad saying that but like it it looks like like honestly it it felt like there were scenes where they were pr like putting him in as a joke 
or like a gag. And people in the theater ate it, ate it up, and they thought it was good. People in the theater were like cheering and clapping and stuff. And look at these people, like, what's wrong with all of you? I think everybody's just committed to the ride and like isolating this movie by itself and looking at it for what it is. Like, dude, Diesel is bad. He is bad. There's a reason all those other movies haven't taken off. So, anyway, sorry. That, by contrast, we have uh, other big muscle man, uh, John Cena, WWE superstar. Uh, as the uh, kind of an- antagonist or, you know, leader of of the antagonist. There's a lot of bad guys in this one. Um, and he's great. Like he, he does this really, he doesn't talk for a lot of the movie, for a lot of the beginning of the movie. He just does like menacing stares and man, he's got it. He's got like the, you know, he's, he's the heel and he's sells- the other thing is like, he's better than diesel in every way. Like he's a better actor. He's just physically bigger. That's the other thing. It's funny because they like they they you know they stand next to each other, getting each other's faces. I'm and I'm like John Cena is like twice your size, man. His arms are way bigger. Yeah, like in every scene they're in, John Cena's acting circles around Vin Diesel. Like it's it's not even a contest. And reportedly, like this is problems they had on other Fast and Furious films, right? Like Diesel and and Dwayne the Rock Johnson supposedly had big beef because they were getting into arguments on set because Diesel was trying to tell the rock how to act and Dwayne Johnson was like dude you are not going to give me acting <laughs> lessons bro like you don't and like I, I can't I can't identify where exactly the problem is like part of me wants to say it's age but Diesel's been in a lot of these movies he's got this character down right the other part of me thinks it's pride he's like uh, he's like Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone 2 Macaulay Culkin does Home Alone 1 he's small time nobody knows him then he blows up and he's huge by the time Home Alone 2 comes around he's got an attitude and he's making a paycheck <laughs> That's what this felt like. It was like Diesel doesn't even want to be there. He's just like showing up, do it, doing his lines. I don't know. Like I, it's grumbling just, family. And yeah, and I don't mean to pin everything on the guy. Like the movies, the movie's got problems. Cause like, you can look at the cast. Not everybody in there is an award-winning actor. Ludacris is terrible. Like he's not that good. He's got like two lines, they're not even that funny. But like it's hard not to point to him when you're talking about this film as a whole. He's literally the centerpiece of the poster. Like he is he is like the shoulders on which the franchise is moved, but it's starting to feel a whole lot more like Fast and the Furious is carrying Vin Diesel and Vin Diesel's not carrying Fast. Yeah, I, I was gonna say if you like when Paul Walker died, like that was a huge blow to the the franchise and just to Hollywood in general as a you know, young superstar. Um Vin, if Vin Diesel doesn't make it to the next movie, I don't think people are going to be that broken up. About yeah. it. Be like, uh, just just replace it with a hundred other bald guys. Right. I mean, they've already they've already swapped in. They they had The Rock come in and do Hobbs and Shaw. You've got John Cena showing up now, like who's who's big and muscle and much better, much better, like acting wise. Um, it's just weird. Like I feel like he's supposed to be this he's, centerpiece. He's probably going to retire his, his character at some point, and like. Have someone, yeah, someone else like The Rock or John Cena continue it, right? I, and at this point, like the 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 universe has grown wide enough that you could easily do that. I mean, very easily. You have so many characters in this film that already you could take five of them and split them off into another film series, and then have three of them go make a streaming show. You've got Hobbs and Shaw. You literally have already done it, and I'm sure they're making another one of those. So you know, like, they, they, there's no reason not to. I don't get why he's still. I don't know why. Why is Vin Diesel still getting a paycheck? I, I, I don't understand it. <laughs> this is now a Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel hate the podcast. I don't. Yeah, dude. And that's. I don't. I know. I know. I know it's bad. Like I. I know I shouldn't be calling him bloat Diesel, and I know I shouldn't be like making so jokes I, about how bad he is. But he's he's base objectively bad. Like he just is. And I I know he can do better. I've seen him do better. He's done eight more of these films. His previous performances are better. Like this one, just like I don't know, he's 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 weary, man. So I, I did want to mention that one thing that that did that I did actually really like about this movie is that they do a lot of these flashbacks of like kind of origin story stuff. And I remember, I think it's the first film you find out that uh, Dominic Toretto he was in prison for a while because he beat a guy with a pipe wrench, um, and uh, he you also hear that his dad died in, in a car wreck while racing so you get to see this all a, a lot of this stuff on screen in in flashbacks and they have younger actors thank god they didn't do de-aging but they use young uh you know t- young teenagers or young 20 something actors uh to play young versions of him and and also john cena's character um this stuff is actually some kind of gritty family stuff like this is uh it, you know vin, D- vin diesel essentially com- commits a terrible crime and does some prison so that his, his younger brother doesn't go to prison um 
and this is like uh, stuff I've seen in in, in like an indie, and that that's actually really interesting. And I was like, that is actually. I could watch a movie just on that stuff because that stuff is really interesting. And that's that which we joke a lot about family uh, in, in this series, but they take the family bonds with Shakespearean seriousness. I mean, like this rival between the two brothers is like, you know, it is like this stone cold, cold blooded thing between them. And they, you know, they have some good speeches yelling at each other about like what happened with their father and, and things. And it's like, it really shouldn't work, but it really does. I really don't understand yeah. it because it, it really is like amidst all these like car crashes and planes and submarines and whatever, you have this family drama and it really doesn't. It's kind of out of place, but it, it somehow it works. Yeah, like these flashback scenes are like surprisingly well shot and they've all got kind of this like desaturated vignette kind of look. But, um, you, you know, kind of illustrating this this early struggle between the characters it was really really smartly done without the cgi de-aging i mean this this is the this is the franchise that put paul walker on screen after he'd passed away right it would have been very easy for them to be like oh we're just gonna de-age vin diesel and stick him on no they recast it totally works it's just like dr sleep right like if you recast old roles instead of just cgiing characters into it it works way better it's a lot less distracting and for what it's worth that stuff is better the kid, the kid who plays young young Dominic Toretto, is a kid named Vinny Bennett, who I haven't seen anything, but is surprisingly good. Uh, even he's better than Vin Diesel. He acts circles <laughs> around him. There, there's a scene. Diesel. There's a scene when like they do this cool duality thing through this mirror, and they shoot both of them on the same side of it, and like. I don't know. I, I realize this is turning into a diesel hate cast real fast. I don't, I don't, I don't mean for it to, but and Andy's right. Like the, the flashback stuff is well done. The action is solid. Um, I'm trying to think of anything really extemporaneous it's, we it, should mention. It's really, it's a little too long. Like, like any su summer blockbuster, yes. it's a good two hours, 25 minutes. That is a long time. Yeah. Two um, hours, 25 is, is long for sure. One, one post mid credit scene I should mention, by the way. Yeah. There, or, there is a mid credit scene. Uh, yes. So stick around. For and and I, I did want to take a moment to talk about this, this film's kind of self-reflexive nature. I think, the Fast and Furious franchise at nine films in is a bit over the hill and it knows it. And the characters actively joke in the film about how they don't die and never get hurt and are invincible. And it's like a running gag in the film. And I, I don't know what that means for the next two films in the franchise, but it seems like safe to say that the people who make the Fast and Furious films not only are keenly aware of how absurd they are, but like I, I, I worry they're running out of things to do. Um, yeah, I mean, it, they, they keep getting bigger. And I, I mean, I was joke. the joke is now like they're going to have to like do time travel or something like that's the only place to go because they've gone everywhere else that they can uh, so far. And, it's, you know, or they're, they're going to show up with the Avengers or, or, you know, something big like that. I, I think you're at a point where uh, kind of like Marvel has done. They've retired a couple of characters and they've had other people. They've introduced other characters to kind of continue on those franchises i think that's kind of what's going to happen happen here and i think that is kind of what what happens with or what is happening with the introduction of john cena's character and also people like i said the cardi b her showing up and re referencing something else which is probably going to lead to another movie uh that those sorts of things but like this core cast yeah it just needs to kind of retire yeah like every everybody's safe nobody's going to get hurt Every movie is going to end with a bucket of Corona light and a grill <laughs> and everybody getting around and praying because family like it's all the same. And like the characters in the movie are actively acknowledging it and responding to it. And it's like that tells me you're running out of gas um, for, for better or worse. I would love it if the next two films in the Fast and Furious franchise, uh, they're supposed to be rumored to be 10 part one and 10 part two. I'd, I'd love it if they went out like Avengers and like in 10 part one, they just kill like half the cast and they won't. They absolutely will not do that. Like there's no way they'll do that. And, and you no, know, the, the it, there's gonna no be, stakes. Vin yeah. Diesel's going to be in a, some sort of explosion. He couldn't have possibly survived. And, and, so, and then he's just going to stumble out and be like, I, I got to retire. I'm getting right. too old for this. 
I'm Diesel, go over this. Diesel will me. fake die at the end of 10 part one and then will show up at the climax for 10 part two and save the day. And then they'll do a whole grill out and they'll say family and then it'll end, I guess. And then they'll make another. It's going to end with a, a grill. That, that, is, that does remind me of a good point. Is it, There is a character, I think the character Han shows up in this who was previously killed in one of the other films. Um, and it's kind of not very clearly brought back uh, to life. Uh, and this and this it it just shows that there's not really any stakes like you're not worried about anyone being in any real danger or dying or you know not coming back because they've literally resurrected a character already right nobody no one's ever really gone like in the next movie dominic toretto's dad is going to show up and be like i didn't really die in that fire that was in the last film that you saw <laughs> like somehow he's gonna he's gonna I'm, be in space he's gonna be a force jedi <laughs> yeah up. like i don't i don't know in aliens like what's next i really don't know um Aliens but, and time, but, time travel. That's all that's left. It's hard to deny this franchise is not in a really odd spot. Like, obviously, they're making a ton of money, and Paramount wants to capitalize on that as well. They should. It's a great property. But, like you said at the beginning, like, I just don't feel like these movies are made for me anymore. I feel like there was a time when, like, they were stealing Panasonic, t you know, VCRs and, and smoking meth, like, in people's garages. And now it's like this weird. I hesitate to use the term whitewash because it's a very diverse cast, but it's a sanitized, like sterilized version of what that's supposed to be. Everybody prays and everybody believes in God and nobody curses and it's PG 13 and nobody dies and there's no blood. And it's like, there's nothing happening here. Like this is just flat and it's we not did, that interesting. And culturally, did, I think it doesn't leave much of a mark. Yeah. We, we did talk about that. It, um, it, it is, it, a hard PG 13 rating. <laughs> it's a hard yes. PG 13 where it's not almost PG. Like, yeah. Really. Like, yeah, there's minimal swearing. There's not any kind of lewd humor or, you know, they're, they're, it's funny because they did have a lot more of that kind of stuff in the earlier films. Um, and they, like you said, they've, they've gotten very, very clean just because the PG 13 rating is the best for, for box office return. So yeah. it's, it's very family friendly now. Yeah, it's this like overproduced product where like nothing bad happens and the characters joke about it on screen. And it's like I'm watching it's like I'm watching a kids cartoon. Like this is this is baby plays with cars and like I just want more. And like I yeah, the old fast and furious, don't get me wrong, like it, it it did not have the budget and it did not have the the blockbuster potential of of what we have now, but it was it was a whole lot more interesting. And um I don't know. I I I think there's a way for fast the Fast and the Furious films get back there, but I, I don't. I don't know if that's what Paramount wants to do. So yeah, they're gonna they're, they're gonna have kids, and then you're gonna have young Dom, young J Dom Junior. Right. Well, I like I was we were talking about this last night, uh, getting ready for the review. Um, you know, Netflix has a Fast and Furious show. It's it's a children's show. It's animated. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and they've got like neon cars with underglow, and they do like secret spy missions. I've never watched it, but I've seen it advertised on there. Like, there's easily easily a way to grow this universe out that way. I mean, you you will make money forever. So. I don't get why we're returning to this formula of like nothing really particularly interesting or captivating is happening. And oh, you've got a fake dead brother we haven't heard about in years. And I don't mm -hmm. know. He's, he's do, do, before I get away too far, but he's not fake. He, John Cena is John Cena. He's on screen, but uh, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> ready for recommendations. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Moving to recommendations. Andy, would you recommend fast nine, the fast saga? I would recommend this to fans of the, of the series. If you've watched all, all the rest of the films or, you know, seen a handful of them, um, you're probably going to enjoy it. It's got lots of action. Again, it's very, it's family friendly. Take, take your parents. Uh, you know, it does have, the cast is fun mostly aside from Vin Diesel. Uh, they, they, there's a lot of fun. There is this whole emphasis on, on family. Um, if you have not seen any of these, you're going to be completely lost. The other thing is if you're just looking to go see an, an action, a kind of mindless action film, it doesn't really matter if you've seen the rest or, or not. But I, I would definitely say it's for fans of the series. Um, I, I would say hard pass, like hard, hard pass. You're not missing anything you're missing this movie. Um, I think, yeah, if you really like them, I guess go for it. If you're, if you're in like the Vin Diesel hate club, <laughs> 
You're going to be all about it. We should definitely movie. see it to, to see it's, it even more. His performance is like almost so bad it's good. Like if there was any time I laughed in the movie, it was at Vin Diesel specifically because of what he was doing on screen. Um, and like I... I, I, I wish I could say there was more going on, but there isn't. Like, if you wanted to watch a Fast and Furious movie and you hadn't seen one, I would never, ever start with F9. I wouldn't even recommend this one as one to work up to. Um, this feels like one of the Saw movies that, like, you never <laughs> recommend to people. You're just like, oh, yeah, they made a bunch. You're not going to miss anything like by Saw skipping that one. Or something. Yeah, like, I don't know. I don't know. And, and I, I hate to say that, but... Um, yeah, this one just did not did not strike me uh, the way I think it was intended. So that's it. That's Fast 9. And with that, uh, we've got some new exciting things coming up. Uh, some trailers coming out soon that we're going to talk about. I'm going to take the first one here. Three trailers total, so stand by for fun. Uh, the movie, first one is The Harder They Fall. So How Do They Fall is a Western drama directed by James Samuel, new director. Uh, this is a film that's coming straight to Netflix, starring a cast of characters, including Idris Elba, Regina King, Lakeith Stanfield, Jonathan Majors, Delroy Lindo, and Zazie Beetz, just to name a few. A killer cast of characters, actually, uh, both in name and stature. Uh, our trailer features Regina King, leading a posse uh, on a train uh, a train heist to to save it's it, assumedly the leader of their group Idris Elba uh, Lakeith Stanfield's with her as well along with Eddie Gathigy. Uh I love the look of this trailer there's a lot of action a lot of things blowing up uh, I don't really know what's happening in it but it looks very visually exciting lots of camera movement Quick action and lots of, I mean, a really good cast. A really good cast. I know we talk about trailers a bit on this show, but if you have the means, go check out the trailer for Harder They Fall. Like, just go watch it and tell me you're not at least mildly interested in what this movie's doing. I think it's either going to be really good or very poor. Uh, but either way, I'm excited. And and James Samuel is a relatively new director. He's done one other film before this one and then a Jay-Z music video uh his other film was a movie called the harder they oh no they they die by dawn i'm sorry which seems to be a lot like this one very similar western um i don't know new director netflix property could be great could be terrible andy what do you think um well it definitely looks really cool great cast like we said uh uh generally i mean almost an all-black cast um kind of a who's who of black actors uh, and it looks awesome. Uh, you know, it's got a lot of action, a lot of style. It's got this great funk soundtrack in the trailer. Um, but you just never know with Netflix. Cause again, they'll, they'll use, they'll sell out money for spectacle and for star power. And then they usually skip on the writing. So like, this looks like a fun action Western, or it could be, it could be lame. It could be terrible writing. It could be a bad story. Like you just never know if this were just coming, if this were coming out in theaters, then I, I would be pretty excited about it. But like, you just never know with Netflix, but it, on the surface, it does look pretty cool. Yeah. And you're a Andy's like spot on with this, by the way, for, for me saying, Oh man, this looks great. He was very quick to remind me this is coming straight to Netflix and like straight to Netflix means one of two things. It's either going to be quality or awful. Like, and I, I really, I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, give it a preview. See what you think of the trailer for the harder they fall. You might, you might just be into it. Andy, what's next. So the other trailer this just dropped today I was very excited about is The Many Saints of Newark, which is the prequel film to The Sopranos, the HBO show that uh, it's almost 20 years old now. Or, it, you know, it's been out for over uh, 20 years when it started. Um, it was a huge cultural show, and it, it has a, a prequel film which comes out on October in October. Um, and kind of it, it goes with... Um, What's the young Tony Soprano is it's kind yes. of his story. We don't really get a lot of details in uh, kind of in this movie, other than we see young versions of people that we, we know. We also see junior Soprano. We, we see some references to other members of the Soprano family. Uh, the father of uh, Dickie Moltisante or uh, Christopher Moltisante, who's a big um, character in, in the show. Uh, this looks cool. I this is one of those things that you're definitely going to have to be familiar with the show. So if you haven't seen The Sopranos, you should definitely start watching now, and you'll be finished by the, by the time the thing comes out. Yeah, I, I need to get started on it. I've never actually watched all the way through Sopranos. I've watched, I think I watched through season one once, and I told people it was boring, and then the whole <laughs> world was like, "What is wrong with you?" And I backed off <laughs> since. I'll get back into it someday, but. 
Uh, anyway, The Many Saints of Newark looks like a pretty good trailer. I, I'm, like I said, I'm not super up on Sopranos, but I know it has a very rich cultural history. There are a lot of diehard Soprano fans out there that are very stoked about this. Uh, on the surface, I'm excited to see Alessandro Nivola getting back into some movies. Uh, most recently, you would have seen him in, oh my God, what was that karate movie? The Art of Self Defense. You're right. Self Defense. Um, Art of Self Defense. Which was super good, by the way, and I think is still on Hulu if you haven't seen it. Really solid film. And if you haven't seen that and you really want to walk it back, he was Billy in Jurassic Park 3, the guy that stole the raptor eggs and then got almost eaten by pterodactyls until he shows up at the end with the military. Um, I don't know why I always think of him in that role, but that was the first <laughs> time I ever saw him. So if you remember Billy in Jurassic Park 3, you know who Alessandro Duvalo is. Also, Ray, Ray Liotta coming back. Leslie Odom Jr. is exciting. I like Corey Stoll and I like John, bon John Bernthal. Like, killer cast, Vera Farmiga. I love it. I love the cast. Uh, I don't like The Sopranos, so I don't know what that means for me. Um, yeah, yeah. sorry. I, I did want to mention that Vera Farmiga plays... Uh, young uh tony soprano's mother the young version and if if you haven't if you're not familiar with the show uh her mother is a very important and very abrasive character uh she's a very abusive uh mother figure even as you know when tony is fully grown and so you can only imagine uh growing up so that's I, uh, important to see her i do remember the mom from the show yeah it was this crotchety kind of grandma character yeah i remember oh, that was the whole thing but anyway um, our last trailer uh, is a movie called Halloween Kills. Halloween Kills is, of course, the sequel to Halloween from just a couple of years ago, I guess. Uh, this is a sequel reboot series of the John Carpenter franchise. This has no way related to the Halloween reboot series from uh, Rob Zombie. He did a couple of those movies. These are unrelated. These pick up uh, the story of Laurie Strode from John Carpenter's original films. Uh, but then this, this is a direct sequel to the most recent Halloween, which follows her story. So this is immediately after the events of that, just like Halloween two, John Carpenter's Halloween two back in the day. This is within minutes of the previous film ending. Uh, the trailer features Laurie Strode and her daughter, uh, leaving the site of where they assume Michael Myers is being burned to death in a house fire. The firefighters show up, they save the place. And in the trailer, you see Michael Myers make it out and obviously uh, strike out to kill again and ultimately find and murder Laurie Strode, assumedly. Uh, this trailer shows like the whole movie. I'm surprised there wasn't the, like the only thing it's missing is the end credits because then you'd have seen the whole thing. Uh, so it's a good thing they didn't include that in the trailer. But this trailer is very exculpatory. So if you're interested in seeing uh, the, the new Halloween movie and you haven't seen the trailer, maybe don't watch it. Cause like it kind of gives away a lot. There's like a lot of kills in there. There's a lot of settings. I'm like, man, they they just they dump it in this movie in this trailer um, to get to get people excited for it. So I yeah, I I enjoyed uh, the reboot. I haven't seen. I mean, there's a, like ten of these movies. I haven't seen most of the of the Halloween series, but I I, w I did watch the reboot uh, from from I guess it was 2019, and then um, so this picks up like you said right after. And there is a third. There's already confirmed third sequel. Um, I think they were filmed back to back that will come out next year as well. So we know that this isn't going to be the the end, which kind of gives away the ending, I guess, in, in a weird way. Because like, no, he's once again, you know, Mike Myers isn't going to really die. Yeah. Like before the before no the ever really gone out. Right. Before the films even come out, we understand that like, OK, the main characters are likely going to survive. There is another one uh, with the trailer gives away a lot. Like it's, it's just a weird way to advertise horror, but that's how it works now. And. For what it's worth, I mean, I like I like the returning stars. I like the returning director, David Gordon Green. I like the last Halloween movie, but this one I hope is a little bit more, I don't know, punchy, bloody, it, it something. Um, and, and it seems like it's going to be. The, the poster features Michael Myers with this burned up half of his mask. Like, I don't know, man, could be dope. I like Halloween movies. I, I, I'm a sucker for those little John Carpenter films, but that's more attributed to Carpenter and less to the new movies. Anyway. Uh, that's Halloween Kills. Could be cool, could be not. Check out the trailer and uh, find out more. And with that, we should jump into our final film of the episode. I'm going to be taking a summary on this one, so please excuse my clumsy delivery. The movie is Disney Pixar's Luca. So Luca is the story of Luca, self-titled, right? Uh, a young, uh, young boy, I should say, uh, who lives just off the Italian coast. A boy fish. Funny. <laughs> Yes, getting to that. There's something funny about Luca. He's also like a fish boy. He's like a mermaid, kind of, but he looks more like a fish and less like 
Disney's The Little Mermaid. Uh, Luca lives under the water, but he dreams of going on shore. And he discovers a, uh, a young boy who's, who's unafraid of the human world, who shows him the ropes and shows him that, hey, when you come out of the water, you just kind of turn into a human. But as soon as you touch water again, you turn back into a fish. And he explains that, you know, we, we can go see people in their town, but we have to have this kind of secret identity and, and people can't find out that we're fishes. And, and meanwhile, Luca's parents below the surface are, are, are terrified of where their son has gone and don't know. And Luca and his friend, uh, what, is, what is his friend's name? Uh, Alberto, uh, 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 end up going into this town where they discover they, they meet a young girl and make friends and they find out about this bike race that they're excited about. Ultimately, it's this kind of charming charming storybook uh, uh tale of of an escape a getaway right and and somebody finding out who they are and kind of kind of what it means to really be themselves uh even if it's not how you present to the world um a lot of people have likened it to uh like an lgbtq metaphor i think that's probably very valid um but i'd be curious to get andy's thoughts on it uh since we haven't talked about that before right now andy's surprise uh <laughs> anyway Andy, uh, well, hold on. The movie is Luca. It's available in theaters and on Disney Plus. Uh, this is not part of their premium subscription. I think, You're not, I think you this is pay just thirty dollars. Yeah, I think it's, it's just Disney Plus. I don't think it's theaters. Really? No, that's a shame. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just like Soul around Christmas, right? You don't have to pay thirty dollars if you have Disney Plus. You can watch it. Um, I still don't know why Disney's doing that with these films, but that's a conversation for another time. The movie is Luca. Andy, what did you think? So I had a little bit of a hard time getting into this uh, movie. I will say for the very, before I get into that, this is a good movie. It's a good kids movie. It's got a very like positive message. Uh, I had a hard time getting into it at, as an adult. I think also because I watched it at home. If I had seen it in a theater, I probably would have been a little bit more focused. Um, it's a little uh, little paint by number when it starts, but it gets better the longer it goes. It's very sweet. It's very charming. Uh, it kind of had this Italian seaside town and it's about these two kind of differing cultures that just kind of don't understand each other and therefore fear each other. So there's a lot of metaphors that can be drawn there. Um, you mentioned LGBTQ. There's also been comparisons to immigration and uh, things like that. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to, uh, to read uh, this film. And like I said, it's it's both the, the fish people fear the people on land, the people on land fe fear you know, sea monsters. And so it's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, fear and name calling and uh, kind of misunderstandings that initially happen and eventually are kind of resolved throughout the rest of the film. It's very sweet. It's very, it's a little bit younger aimed than I think a lot of uh, Pixar stuff is. Um, it just, just seemed aimed at a little bit slightly younger audiences. Um, so it wasn't really for me, I had a hard time getting into it, but I, I think uh, if you've got kids, they'll probably love it. So every Pixar movie feels different. I think it's it's rare that they feel very similar to each other if they're not a direct sequel, right? Toy Story Two feels a lot like Toy Story One, but um, you know, Inside Out feels very different from Monsters Inc. Um, Pixar movies are, are kind of heralded for their unique identities and 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 how individual they feel, and Pixar is usually uh, seemingly unafraid of trying out new things. And, and this is a first time feature film from director Enrico Casarosa, uh, Casarosa, who only previously he's, he's worked on other animated films, but the only other thing he's directed is another Pixar short, La Luna. Uh, actually, you may remember it. I don't remember what movie it ran in front of him. It came out in 2011. It's got a young boy and he's in a little rowboat with his dad and they see these things falling from the, the moon. And so they like float up to the moon and they get these like star pieces, the same director of that and the animation style is shockingly similar uh, in fact the characters in each of them seem derivative of one another well luna luca either way um th the animation is very like childish it's it, it andy said yesterday when we were talking about this it reminded him ardman animation uh and i agree uh ardman animation is a studio that does wallace and gromit um or it, this looks a lot like an ardman film actually the same way they're 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 kind of Everybody has these kind of like bouncy heads and figures, lots of big circles and oblong shapes. Everybody's mouths are kind of like these big oval things that open on the side of their faces. And like everything presents very cleanly to the camera, big, wide open eyes. And, and, and the fish kind of people uh, that we see are the same way. Like they're just a slightly different color, but ultimately they look almost the same. Big open eyes, like very, very ready to see the world. Very colorful, very rich, saturated colors. And in our setting, this kind of Italian seaside town is very charming, right? Everybody eats pasta and rides Vespas and like, I don't know, they, they just they just kind of living out there in the summer and things are good. 
And yeah. in that way, Every, like, everyone... I, I love the look of this movie. I, 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 I think it looks very charming. I was going to say everyone is super Italian and yes. has very Italian named and speaks with, uh, you know, they, they, there's a lot of Italian words in this as well. And I watched this with subtitles and a, a lot of it is not uh, translated. It's just you you kind of understand what's going on or what the, the expression uh, of it is. Right. Uh, a, a stark amount of it actually isn't translated. Yeah, they kind of just expect you to figure it out. And in that way, I think Luca is a movie that is aimed more at children than adults. And it's weird with Pixar, right? Because I, I've heard it said before that Pixar is a studio that makes films for adults that are that can be enjoyed by kids. And I think a lot of the time that's true. Like the message underneath is is very adult and very oriented and very serious. Soul was like the antithesis of that. That is that is an adult film for adults. Like that is not a kids movie. Um, this one, however, almost goes completely the opposite way. There's definitely a message there. There's definitely metaphors to pick up. But like it's a 95 minute kids film, start to finish. Like it is a movie made for children. It is for people who have the attention span of kids. Our plot moves very quickly. We are jumping from bit to bit. Like our characters don't spend a lot of time thinking and planning. They kind of just do the thing because they're children. And I think that can make it feel a little difficult to hold your attention because it's so dis dis disparate. Like it's, it's plot just feels a little all over the place. And it, I've, I've heard people say I had to watch it in two sittings or I got bored um, I watched it in one just fine, but I was watching it with an audience. Andy, you you didn't have that that luxury. Yeah, no, I was uh, by myself, and I'm not gonna lie, the phone came out pretty quick. <laughs> um, and again, it's not it's not the film's fault. It's just it. Uh, again, I was watching it at home. It's not. I'm not the target audience. Right. Um, so I had, uh, I had difficulty focusing. Um, but it's it. But that, that again, that doesn't speak ill ill of the film. It's just wasn't for me. Yeah, and that's all right. Uh, I did want to take a moment to uh, highlight some of the kind of more meaningful moments in the film, I think, that are carried by our uh, wonderful cast. Our lead, Luca, is played by Jacob Tremblay, very big child actor. Uh, Alberto, his friend, is played by Jack Dylan Grazer, who you've seen most recently in Shazam or It. Uh, Emma Berman, who's a Disney star, plays uh, the girl, Julia. Um, solid. Solid, solid performances from all three of them, even more so when you consider that all three of them were recorded at home during the pandemic. Uh, Jack Dylan Grazer uh, has a TikTok account and he was posting videos from like inside his mom's closet with blankets on the walls recording the audio for this movie. So it's weird that like oh, wow. it. Yeah, it was made so disparately from people who are, are at home like this. This is a pandemic film. That's when this movie was made. Um, almost start to finish. And it's, it's weird how well it still seems to come together. But I do think that might be part of the reason why it feels a little disjointed in some scenes. Um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a disjointed production. Yeah, I'm, I'm really surprised at that. Um, I didn't really notice that uh, too much. And that, that's kind of amazing that, that they managed to, to get that. Yeah, I, I think it is. But I think that's part of the reason it just feels a little different. Like this is Pixar trying to put something together that they hadn't, hadn't done before. You know, usually you have people in studio and like any good animation studio, they crunch them and make them work 80 hour weeks until they're miserable. And, you know, it's Pixar. But I, I this one didn't quite go that way. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of what Pixar does, I mean, a lot of their movies are just ma masterpieces of filmmaking and animation and this isn't quite that, but it's, I mean, they have, they have set their own ridiculously high bar and not everything is going to be inside out or the Incredibles or toy story, um, you know, and, but that doesn't mean it's not, not good filmmaking, but I think that's why this has just been released on Disney plus and not in theaters. Yeah. And it, it'll mean different things to different people too. That's another thing. Pixar films are really good at, um, you know, for me, I watched this and thought, okay, it's pretty solid. It's not as good as like, you know, toy story, but it's not as bad as like cars three. Like it's kind of comfortably <laughs> in the middle, you know, it's, it's, it's no, it's no inside out, but it, it's not the good dinosaur. Like it's kind of, it's kind of lands right in there. Meanwhile, I watched it with my wife, Christine. She was like, this might be top five. She loved this movie. So it was different for everyone. And, and it didn't quite resonate with me the same way, but I really liked a lot of the things they're doing in here. And, and Andy, meanwhile, is a bit more of a wash, but that's okay. That's why we do a movie podcast. That's why we do two movies a week and not just one. This, this, this is why right here. So, <laughs> Um, I thought the music was really charming. I, I, I did want to again mention the color, like just the look of this movie. It just feels very bright and very like seaside beachy. Um, obviously, the plot, you can draw some comparisons to The Little Mermaid, but I think there's something to be said for having two characters who are distinctly male. Um, 
I, I think, like I said, I agree with the kind of metaphors that this may be a queer story. Um, it might be more charming that way uh, to kind of look at it through that lens. But your mileage may vary. You know, I think it's important to watch it and see what you think. And never, never go in overhyped. Now, never go in thinking something is going to be something it isn't because you'll just be disappointed. Um, Andy, any other thoughts? I, I, I hate to blow through this, but it's a 95 minute kids well, kids movie. Like right. I don't have a lot of. Yeah. Well, we mentioned why was this only released on Disney Plus? Yeah, so I've got I've got hot takes as to why that is, but it's it's basically bordering on conspiracy theory at this point, <laughs> like QAnon level Pizzagate nonsense. So I'll talk about that in a second. But Andy, can you give us probably a more grounded reason why that is? And what what do you think? I mean, I, I know why, why I think, but I think I, I what I think is crazy. Again, the 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 bar is very hard when you hear hear Pixar. Like you're it. It's usually like you know the best one of their best releases of, of the year, and um, it's like last year you had Onward and um, oh I can't remember the jazz Soul um, Soul being the much better film, but Onward was still very good in its in its own right, and that's that's what kind of this feels. If if we hadn't been going through the pandemic, this would have been a spring release. This isn't the big summer Pixar our release, so it's it's a smaller film. It's not as good as they make and. Again, it's a bonus for Disney Plus because streaming services need content and they can't just do premium stuff. Like you can do some you can do like a Black Widow or was it Cruella, but like you also just need to be adding free content to your subscription. And that's part of what this does. Yeah, Disney Plus adds a lot of like little stuff, little shows and like old stuff from the catalogs, right? Old films, but um, it's rare they're pumping out like new premium quality films to be included with your subscription. Pixar films are one of those things, which I love. Um, what frustrates me is the treatment of, at least to me, the, the surface level treatment of of these films and how they're kind of presented to the audience, right? Um, Pixar films infamously win awards. Like Pixar films uh, do very well it, it, during awards season, which is a big deal for any movie studio, including the House of Mouse. They want to win awards, right? Disney worked with Pixar for a very long time in collaboration with them, but never actually owned them, right? Pixar was its own studio for years. And it wasn't until, what, a little after 2010, I think, that Disney formally said, hey, we're going to acquire Pixar. At that point, Disney was no longer making really any animated films. Their hand-animated films kind of washed out. They tried to do Home on the Range, which was a big failure and didn't go anywhere. But they were trying to get back into animated movies, so they bought Pixar. And, and this is where the crux of my conspiracy theory argument comes from. I'll try to keep this quick. I'm sorry. Uh, Disney is slowly dismantling Pixar from the inside and taking its best animators and moving it over to Disney animated films to make it more a House of Mouse production and less a Disney Pixar thing. And a big part of that is moving all of Pixar's features to basically be a free tier in Disney Plus and keeping Disney's animated movies like Frozen 2 at a $30 premium subscription price to say, right. hey, Ryan, the these, last dragon. Right. Yes. Our movies are better. Pixar's movies are lesser. And I think that started when they bought Pixar. And then a couple years later, Pixar comes out with The Good Dinosaur and Disney comes out with their first animated feature in years, Tangled. And then Pixar comes out with, I don't know, Cars 3 or something. And D Disney makes Frozen. Like, and if you look at the credits for Tangled and Frozen in these Disney animated films, they're all consulted by Pixar consultants. Pixar heads are working on them. Pixar animators are assisting. And meanwhile, Pixar is getting shorter movies that are being pushed straight to Disney+. Plus. I don't know if this is what's happening. I, I, it's, a, it's a conspiracy theory at best. I do know Disney recently shut down Blue Sky Studios, the biggest Eastern animation studio in the United States. They put thousands, well, hundreds, I should say, of, 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 of the best animators in film out of a job and did not make much of an effort to rehire them. Disney is not afraid to steamroll anybody, including, I think... Pixar. That's my theory about why it's you better be careful. The mouse is going to be knocking on your door. <laughs> yeah, man. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if that's the case. I just there's yeah right. There's just there's just a timeline. Like Disney acquires Pixar. Pixar's films get markedly worse. Disney's animated films get markedly better. Now Disney Pixar's films are free on Disney Plus. Ryan Last Dragon's thirty dollars. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm there's, wrong. I think there's, I just, there's definitely a trend there. It's I weird. Think. Yes, it's weird. Um, so that's all. But I like Luca. I really do. I, I like it just fine. And we should probably move into. I, we done, we haven't done recommendations yet, have we? Have no, we, we have not. No. Oh God, I'm sorry. You've I meant been to on do the conspiracy ramble. theory after. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, I'll let that get away from me. Andy, would you recommend Disney Pixar's Luca? 
Yeah, I, I would for younger audiences. Like I said, it, it didn't really grab me. I had a hard time focusing. Um, but it, like I said, it, I'm not the target audience. But it, it's a sweet movie. It's got an important message. It, the animation, as always, looks really good. It's not as, as wild and crazy as, as the worlds that they've built in something like Inside Out or or in Soul, which are much more like abstract and ethereal. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a grounded place. This is more uh, almost like a Studio Ghibli film. Uh, you, you could see them making kind of a version of this Ponyo. Uh, so that's kind of who I would recommend it for. Definitely, you know, it's safe for the family, for the kids, that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd recommend it as well. I wouldn't, I, I'm not going to say it's like a top five Pixar movie for me or anything. Like if I had a selection of Pixar films to watch, I, this may not be the first one, but they're all different, right? And it depends on who you are and what you get from these things. Luca is a charming 95 minute storybook adventure of a film. It's almost a short film. It moves so quickly. Like, and I don't mind that. Like that doesn't, that doesn't hurt it. It makes for a different experience, which when I come to Pixar, that's what I want ultimately is something different. And I think it does a great job of that. I, I think it presents a strong metaphor for what it's supposed to be and what it's trying to say. I hope that's the intention of the filmmakers and not just a perceived notation by you know, consumers on the internet um, because it feels, it feels honest and it feels like a really, really strong story from a director who's clearly very passionate about it. So I like Luca. I like Luca a lot. I think it's, I think it's good stuff. And if, if you've already got Disney plus, there's literally no reason not to watch it because you already have paid to watch it anyway. So go ahead and give it a shot. If you have a means. <sighs> and with that, I think I wraps our show for the week. Uh, Andy next weekend, big weekend, holiday weekend, July 4th weekend. What are we watching? All right, so we're going to actually be taking the week off because yes, we are. Th there there isn't any really big releases. the The new release next week or this this week uh, this Friday is uh, the Forever Purge um, that continue that series continues to somehow have life. Um, but uh, you know, and I was wondering why Black Widow wasn't coming out next week. Then I realized Fast Fast Nine is going to have some legs, some serious legs, and they're probably going to make a ton of money over the holiday weekend as well. But anyways, we're going to be taking the week off. But then when we come back. We will come back with uh, a review for Black Widow, which comes out on July 9th in, on both in theaters and on Disney Plus for a $30 premium fee. And we will also find something else on streaming to watch in July. So that's uh, what's coming up. That's right. Big things are happening. Uh, I'm sorry. We're likely not watching the Forever Purge. That's totally me. I, I watched the trailer. If you're a Purge fan, like mad respect. But I watched the trailer for the Forever Purge. and It looks like Tremors 6, dude. Like it just looks... <laughs> It just looks low brow. Like it does not look particularly cinematic. It looks like it's straight to DVD. Um, I like that your so, comparison for every bad movie is Tremor Six because you said the same thing about Army of the Dead. Well, yeah, like <laughs> the the Tremors franchise is such a great example of like a series with a great hook that had one or two good movies. And then they made 12 more and they all just got progressively worse. And like, it's, it's like Sharknado quality. Now it's so bad. And that's what a lot of these cash in movies kind of feel like. It's just like, there's no heart behind this. You guys are just making it to make a buck, you know? And like, I think that shows, I, th I think, I think, the, I think audiences are smarter. I think they see that. I say that having gone and seen fast nine in a room full of people who clapped when Vin Diesel came on screen. Uh, so <laughs> what do I know? But I don't know. If you enjoyed the show today, if you like what we're doing here on Off Script, if you want to support us, maybe let us know that you're a fan of the show and that you like what we're doing here. The easiest thing you can do is just subscribe. Just subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting platform to get new episodes of Off Script delivered straight to you every single Tuesday when we do them, except next week because we're off. Uh, we stream our show on Facebook live at about five o'clock central every Tuesday on our Facebook page, Off Script Film Review. Come check us out. See what we look like, huh? Get a look at these smiling mugs. How about <laughs> that? Right. Yeah, see what we got going on. Like, comment, subscribe, do all those things. You can follow us over there. You can follow us on Twitter, we're on Instagram. Uh, and we're on YouTube where we upload our live episodes uh, every Tuesday evening as well. And of course, you can follow us on your favorite podcasting platform. But again, the biggest thing you could do is just subscribe. You can also rate and review. I mean, that would help a ton too, but that's like that's that's like extra credit. Nobody, nobody ever rates and reviews. I would I wouldn't expect you, dear listener, to do that. That's that's above you. But if you could, it'd mean a lot, man. Also, you could write us an email, mail at offscriptfilmreview.com, and you can check out our website, offscriptfilmreview.com, for news, reviews, interviews, and more. From all of us at Offscript, the home of Bold Cinema, I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Thanks for watching.